So thanks, Marco, and thanks, Alfonso, for having lawyers on board. And I have to tell you that they had to put up with not one lawyer, but three of us, because the research that I'm going to talk about is a collaborative work with other two colleagues from the law department, Aura Bertoni and Maria Teresa Mangiolino. Even lawyers can collaborate in the digital age, which is a disruptive innovation, I think. So I'm going to talk about data, as Marco said, and how to open these data. Public data, to a certain extent, are already open, so now we have to focus on, pri on private data. However, I'll just get started by telling you a couple of examples that I think are quite relevant and I like very much. These are successful innovations that are based on public data, open public data. This is Tunnel Vision. I don't know if you have experienced this app, but you go to New York and you have to take the subway, and here you have an app where that gives you real-time information on trains and stations. But the way in which the information is given to you is through animated visualization. So you point your device, and you'll see where your train is. You'll see how much people in the station. You don't like the station, the train is late. The app tells you an alternative route, or you want to wait, the app can entertain you on information about neighborhoods, any neighborhood in New York City. You again, you point the device, and the app will tell you their rental prices, the population there, density, and so on and so forth. How is this possible? Well, the technology adopted and developed here uses MTA map, because you have to point your device to MTA maps, to, for these animated data visualizations. That means that they pull data out of open data sets to, provide you, to, to give you those informations. The data sets that they use are the MTA and the U, US Census open data sets. Now, nice, this is in New York, but we have something very similar in Italy as well. This app, OpenMove, is in charge, it's a platform actually, in charge of mobile ticketing for all public transports in the province of Trentino. It sells you the tickets, all the tickets that you need to go where you have to go. And moreover, it also gives you all the offers by local retailers along the way, in case you want to stop and just adhere to one of these offers. Again, how is this possible? A couple of years ago, the province of Trentino decided to open up something like 1,500 data sets. They launched a contest, Open Data Challenge. Hey, come and use this data. Make businesses out of this data. OpenMove was the winner. You may now wonder, but are open data just public data? How about private data? We'll talk about private data in a minute. First, let me tell you how we arrived to the point of having the availability of public data, to the point of having public data opened. The availability of public data is the result can be the result of two different processes. In the US, for example, local municipalities, public bodies, they adhered to this open government data. They decide that this is a value, this is a strategy that they want to follow, and they, on a voluntary basis, decide to open their public data. 
and the open government data principles have been developed by a bunch of open government advocates. This is what we call in legalese a bottom-up process. In the EU, the availability of public data is the result of a top-down process. In 2003, a directive was adopted. This is the Public Sector Information Directive requiring public bodies to open, of course, to certain conditions, to open up their public data for reuse by any third parties. Reuse which could be for commercial and non-commercial purposes. If this is the availability, the way in which we actually have access and can reuse open public data, we may wonder if we don't want the same for public data, we may wonder, but are, should public data be just, should open data be just public data? Let me tell you another couple of stories that may add some other elements to the picture that I'm trying here to depict. This is Hoodline. You go to San Francisco, you have to rent a room, rent a car, you want to know what's going on, you have to rent a conference room, for example. Hoodline is the platform that will give you all the information to do that. Hood, how, how can Hoodline have all those information? It actually started like a local news website, but now Hoodline has partnered with all those private companies that you see there. That means that those private companies have opened their APIs, which are the interfaces, the keys, to let their private data sets be accessed. And this is the way in which Hoodlines can actually add the information and answer your answers. Another example, which is not a trendy startup for once, is Arup. Arup is a very traditional UK-based multinational firm offering consulting, engineering, and design services for the built environment. So what does Arup do? Arup uses the data that have been opened by the Office for National Statistics to better understand how its architectural projects must relate to the surrounding places and inhabiting people. But more than that, Arup has partnered with data startups to acquire even more useful knowledge. Just an example of what they have done. A few years ago, Arup installed something like 200 sensors in its London offices. The sensors were provided by a private company, Open Sensors. The data, the idea there was to gather data on how employees leave the places where they work. They acquired knowledge by doing this, and at the same time, all those data are now stored in open sensors, open private data repository, and they are available for other third parties to be used for free. Open private data, then, can be a very useful resource as long as private companies decide to open them. And this is something that we, we are witnessing, but is not such a common practice yet. And here is where the lawyer comes. Why is this not a common practice? Because there are legal hurdles. Well, there are technical hurdles as well, but there are several legal hurdles too. 
These hurdles relate mainly to availability and liability issues. Availability, for example, is impaired by, first, something that we call fragmenting data localization rules. What do I mean here? Actually, national governments adopt rules on, let's say, and this is quite a tricky point, uh, data localization. These rules change one country from the other country. And even within one country, you will have certain data localization rules for certain kinds of data and other data localization rules for other kinds of data. This is a fragmented scenario, which doesn't enable free flow of data. Availability is then impaired by the formats in which these data are released, because if the format is interoperable, you there have a data set which is useless. You can't use that data set with other data sets, even if the data are open. And the same thing we can say about quality. If you open a data set which has a very low quality, who's going to use that? And painfully, we all know that opening data, the availability of open data is impaired by compliance with personal data rules. Although there are ways to make personal data, non-personal data anymore, this is a long way uh, to go, and we definitely have to work on this. In terms of liability issue, issues, just to give you an example, let's imagine that you open up your data. So the safety standards there must be much higher than if you keep your data closed. And the same goes for cybercrime. The risk of a cyber attacks are here much higher than if your data are not open to the public. Given these hurdles, what are the actions that we should take in order to achieve what I like to define a functional data ecosystem, also based on private data, not just public data? Well, good news. Action is ongoing. Action is ongoing at legislative level and at non-legislative level. And bear in mind that these two approaches are actually complementary. They are not alternative approaches, at least in our view. Action is ongoing in Europe at European level and even within some European countries. For example, in France, they recently adopted a law that says those companies who hold private data that are of public interest should open them. What are they talking about? What data are they talking about? Well, they're talking about gas consumption and production data. They're talking about data generated in the course of procurements. They're talking about data on real estate transfers. They're talking about some commercial data that might be needed for statistical purposes. At European level, a very important piece of legislation has been recently adopted. And I'm here talking about the open banking. This is the Payment Services Directive also called PSD2, which requires banks to open data that they have on their customers' accounts to enable third parties to develop and offer financial services that are based on those data and on banks' infrastructures. In other words, to enable the fintech companies' activities. The directive, though, doesn't tell you how to do it, how to, you should open this data. And this is where the legislative approach comes into the pic the non-legislative approach comes into the picture. In UK, the Open Banking Group ha is developing the API specifications that are needed to set 
an open and standard API. In other words, they have decided how this should be done, and they have decided this with the involvement of the stakeholders, which then, on a voluntary base, will adopt that open interface. More in general, we have to remember that a public consultations just closed on this topic. The title of the consultation is Building a European Data Economy. Their hurdles have been identified. Solutions have also been, you know, proposed. Action is ongoing, and we will witness more action in the next future. My last point, and here I will conclude. The world I depicted is a world where there is some good, is a world where we do have still a long way to go and a lot of work to do, especially lawyers, at least they have to do that. They have to really figure out how to have how to enable this functional data frame, ecosystem I'm talking about. What enabling legal framework we have to think to really foster this functional data ecosystem? I don't really have the answer right away, but what I can tell you is that this enabling framework should at least meet the following features. Its rules should be global, as the economy is in this field, in this sector. And here, I'm not being visionary. Lawyers are never visionary. I'm just saying, think back in the 80s when the OECD adopted, you know, the privacy protection guidelines, and they are now at the core of any privacy protection legislations in the world. Rules should be standard. As to the conditions to which the data are opened, as well as to the technology that should enable the opening. Rules should be flexible. Well, rules can be flexible. Think of the open banking example that I gave you. You have an obligation which is there, the legislator says so, and then you have stakeholders working together to actually understand how to put in practice that obligation. This is what we call a co-regulatory process. These are the processes that can actually help us strike in a proper balance between, on the one hand, something that we definitely need, which is legal certainty. And on the other hand, the need of having rules in sectors like this that can be changed, that can be easily updated. Thank you.